In this section we're going to continue our conversation about limits, but now we're going to be looking at limits involving infinity, not necessarily as a solution, but as a value that we're looking to approach toward. We're also going to be looking at how we can use this idea of limits at infinity to find horizontal asymptotes of graphs, and we'll also be looking at vertical asymptotes and a little bit about slant asymptotes. So to get started, let's go ahead and look at a very familiar graph right now. Uh, let's look at the limit, we'll talk about x here in a second, of 1 over x. Now before we've looked at this graph, and we've taken the limit as x approaches 0. So let's go ahead and do a quick curve sketch first. And Again, this is a graph that you should be able to sketch pretty easily. First and third quadrants. Okay, and we see here that I have an asymptotic line at x equals 0 because that would make this fraction undefined. Kind of more surprisingly though, there's actually a horizontal asymptote here. So we have a vertical asymptote and then this horizontal asymptote as well. So now when we start talking about this graph, instead of taking the limit as x approaches 0, like I said that we've done before, we're going to take the limit as x approaches infinity. Now as x approaches infinity, what that means is I'm going further and further and further out in my x direction, and then we can see my y values are going closer and closer and closer to the x-axis, but they'll never cross the x-axis. So another way to think about this this value of x that's in the denominator is getting larger and larger and larger. 1 over 10, 1 over 1,000, 1 over a million, 1 over a trillion. What's happening here is this number is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and it is approaching or going towards 0. So this limit is 0. So one way that we can talk about this is I have a fixed numerator, I have a denominator that's increasing without bound, so that gives me an idea that the overall fraction is going towards 0. So in this case, I'm talking about the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 over x is equal to 0. Now I could also talk on this side about the limit as x approaches negative infinity of my function as well. As I approach negative infinity, I can see that the same thing is happening. It's getting closer and closer and closer to 0. And this would be like 1 over negative 100, 1 over negative 1,000, 1 over negative a billion, and we can see that's going towards 0 as well. Now I'm not comparing these two points. I'm not taking the limit from the right and the limit from the left. I'm just taking this overall limit on each side. So again, this one matches over here, and this is kind of its own little limit down here. So these are limits that we're using to involve infinity, not necessarily as solutions, but as a limiting value. Let's go ahead and look at another graph. Let's look at the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 over x squared. Well, the graph is different, but the idea is the same. So when we talk about the graph of 1 over x squared, and again, this is a graph that I would expect that you'd be able to use on an exam. You should be able to sketch this. Basically what happens with 1 over x squared is it hits the x-axis faster, and anything that's down here in the third quadrant pops up into the second quadrant because I'm squaring the value, so what's negative squared becomes positive. So when I'm looking at, as x approaches infinity, I'm really only interested in this first quadrant. And again, my numerator is fixed, my denominator is increasing without bound, and so my overall limit is going toward 0. And I can see that pretty clearly, it's going toward 0, getting closer and closer to the x-axis. Let's go ahead and look at another graph. And this is always kind of a deceiving graph. The limit as x approaches infinity of the constant 2. Well, the constant 2, we have a couple of options here. Is, x, is the constant 2, is that a vertical or a horizontal graph? And the answer is, it's a horizontal graph. It's the graph of y equal 2. So when we look at this and we say as x goes toward infinity, we can see that this is never changing. And so my solution here is 2. And the idea here is the limit of a constant is a constant. So that is not changing. Let's go ahead and look at some more examples. For this example, let's look at the limit as x approaches infinity of 3 root 2 over x plus 4. I don't want to graph this one, I just kind of want to analyze this and see what I can come up with. Well, when I look at this, I know that the numerator is never changing, it's fixed. And the denominator is going toward infinity plus 4, which is another uh, degree of infinity. 
So I usually think of this as it's increasing. So I have a fixed numerator, an increasing denominator, so what's happening is this overall fraction is going towards zero as well. So we need to get used to that idea of talking about a fixed numerator, increasing denominator, or a fixed numerator, decreasing denominator, and some other types of relationships there to try and figure out what's happening with some of these limits. Now let's get into some more complicated and interesting cases. Let's look at the limit as x approaches infinity, and we'll look at some negative infinities as well, but for now let's look at the limit as x approaches infinity, and as a quick note, we're not taking the limit from the right and the limit from the left here, we're just taking the limit as x approaches infinity. We could do that, okay, but we typically don't need to do that with limits of infinity. Okay, this one's a lot more complicated. Um, when I, you know, you can't plug infinity in, but when you take the limit as x approaches infinity here, I get another infinity. Down here, I get infinity as well. Now they're different infinities, but they're both infinities, and what happens is this is an indeterminate form. Remember, zero over zero is indeterminate, now infinity over infinity is another indeterminate, and indeterminate means to do more work. Well, we have one idea here that we can work with this algebraically. First of all, this doesn't factor, otherwise I could go after that. But my rule here is, if I run into this case, something I could do, I don't have to, there's other things we can try, but one thing I could do is divide through by the highest power of the exponent. in the denominator. Now remember we have to be careful how we do this because it has to you know make sense mathematically I can't just divide through by a number when it suits me if I divide through by a number I have to also multiply by the number and, and essentially multiply by one if I do that. So again I have to make sure I actually do this with the numerator and the denominator. Now when we do this we multiply both the numerator and denominator and the overall effect is you're dividing through by every term. So let's look at the limit as x approaches infinity of 3x squared plus 2x plus 1. Now let's look at that highest power. And it's not always the first power because it's not guaranteed to be written in a nice standard decreasing order form. But look for the highest power. In this case it's x squared. So we would divide through by x squared every single term. And we do the same to the denominator. Now remember, when you divide by a fraction, you're multiplying by the reciprocal. So the overall effect here is I multiplied by x squared and divided by x squared when you end up inverting those. Then I simplify these and I start taking limits. For here, I'll just get a 3. Here I'll have 2 over x plus 1 over x squared. Here I'll have a 6 plus 7 over x squared. Now when I go to take that limit, I have a fixed numerator. I have a denominator that's increasing without bound, so this goes to zero. This goes to zero for the same reason as does this. So you can see here that I'm left with 3 over 6, which is 1 half, and that is my solution. Now, we could also kind of look at this and maybe get an idea of what my solution was and come up with a pattern. See the 3 and the 6 out front? And I went through all this work and I got a 3, 6 for my solution which reduced to 1 half. So that kind of tells me that, hmm, something might be going on here that I might be able to depend upon to create some shortcut rules. Well, let's go ahead and pop open Maple and let's look at this graphically. And then we'll also use that limit expressions palette, that limit function to actually determine this limit to check our work. So in Maple, to start off with, I'm just going to input the function and we'll kind of work from there. So we have 3 times x squared, whoops, 3 times x squared, plus 2 times x, plus 1, divided through by the 6x squared, 6 times x squared, plus 7. So we have our semicolon here at the end, and yes, that is the function I'm looking for. So let's go ahead and look at a quick graph of this. We're going to see something interesting that pops up out of here. Huh, it really is interesting. So it looks like there's a minimum point here, and then it looks like something's going on interesting here and here. I'm going to pop this into our lecture real quick, and we'll talk about exactly what this graph is indicating.
And again, I expect that you guys are doing this in Maple as well and that you're learning how to use Maple as we go. So on a test or a quiz, if we happen to have some Maple problems, that you wouldn't have any difficulty there. Well, what's happening here is right here, it kind of looks like something's occurring on the left and the right hand side. And what this actually is at point 0.5, remember point 0.5 is right here at 1 half, is this is called a horizontal asymptote. This is y equals 0 0.5, which is the horizontal asymptote. So when we look at this, we can see that this value up here is getting closer and closer to this line y equals 0 0.5. It is as x goes toward infinity, and it's also doing this as x goes, goes toward negative infinity. But I kind of look at this graph and I wonder, it's like, well, wait a minute, it's crossing the line. Well, as it turns out, you can cross a horizontal asymptote. Okay, so a graph can cross a horizontal asymptote locally, but it will not cross as you go toward infinity or toward negative infinity. So that's something to remember as well. You can cross a horizontal asymptote. Now, let's go ahead and look at what Maple says about finding the limit here. So popping open Maple, uh, this function is the one I wanted to work with. So I'm going to copy it. And then down here, we're using our limit notation. I'm going to paste it in. I want to find the limit of this function as x goes toward infinity. Now, in order to use infinity, we need to type it out. But just in case you don't remember what to do, you can look at this common symbols palette and just click on the symbol and you can see down here it types in infinity for you. And it tells us the same thing. As x approaches infinity, my solution is 1 half. So let's pop that in as well. So the things I've figured out now, based on what we've just done, is if I take a limit as x approaches infinity, and even with this graph right here, I can see that if that's happening as x approaches negative infinity as well, it gives me information about a horizontal asymptote. So quick note, limits as x approaches positive or negative infinity help determine horizontal asymptotes, H, A. And again, we use HA to represent horizontal asymptotes. Also, as another interesting point, a horizontal asymptote can be crossed. The graph can cross a horizontal asymptote locally, but not toward plus or minus infinity. It will not cross. Okay? So those are the things that we've kind of come up with here. Now let's go ahead and look at another problem that brings up another interesting conundrum. Let's look at the limit as x approaches negative infinity. We're not approaching infinity from the left. This is approaching negative infinity of 6x plus 5 all over x squared plus 2x plus 1. Okay, let's plug directly in. In my numerator, I'd have a negative infinity. In my denominator, I'd have infinity squared plus 2 times a negative infinity plus 1. What's going to happen here is this will be some value of a positive infinity. This will be a large positive value. This will be a smaller negative value, and plus 1 really has no effect here. Well, this is another indeterminate form. And indeterminate means to do more work. Well, what is the more work we know how to do? Divide through by the highest power of the exponent in the denominator. So let's go ahead and do that. So we'd have 6x over x squared plus 5 over x squared. And again, every single term you have to divide through by. If you don't, then you're actually changing the value of the equation. Now when we simplify this, 6x over x squared simplifies to 6 over x. Hmm, you can see we have a problem here already. I'm not getting things to cancel like would be nice. Now when I take the limit as x approaches negative infinity, this piece and this piece in the numerator are both going to 0, and these pieces in the denominator are, and I end up with 0 over 1, which is 0. That's the correct solution. This is implying to me that I have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. Hmm. So the coefficient business didn't work like it did in the last one. In the last one, if you remember,
we decided that once we found our solution, I just could look at the two numbers out front, and that would be the ratio of my solution here with the coefficients. It didn't work in this one. But also notice that my powers are different as well. But I'm kind of getting some ideas here on how we could come up with some shortcut rules defining these limits. Now again, you could graph this in Maple, and you'd see this idea of a horizontal asymptote, and you'd also could check this solution in Maple using your limit function. Let's look at a third case. Limit as x approaches uh, negative infinity of 2x cubed plus 5 in my numerator, and my denominator will be um, x minus 1. So plugging in here, I'm going to have a negative infinity over negative infinity, which is indeterminate. So basically, if I have any comparison of infinities, positive or negative, I get an indeterminate form. And indeterminate means to do more work. Well, the more work that we can do is to divide through by the highest power of the exponent in the denominator. You guys will love these shortcut rules when we finally get to them because they make this work a lot easier. And then we simplify. So I have 2x squared plus 5 over x, 1 minus 1 over x. Now as we take that limit, I have a fixed numerator, increasing denominator, so that goes to 0. And then here, when I finally take the limit, I have a negative infinity squared. That's infinity times 2 is another degree of infinity. This is infinity. Therefore, the limit, d, d and e. So the limit here is infinite, which means the limit does not exist at all. Now what does this mean in terms of horizontal asymptotes? Because everything I've looked at before, when I got my solution, I would say, oh, that's my horizontal asymptote. Well, this implies that there is no horizontal asymptote, because there is no limiting value. Well, this is all kind of fun to work with, but it's a lot of work algebraically when we could see some patterns and some trends occurring here. So these are our shortcut rules that we can develop out of this. And these shortcuts only apply for values as x approaches positive or negative infinity. These rules do not apply if I'm approaching plus or minus 2. These shortcut rules only apply for limits as x approaches plus or minus infinity. And you will want to memorize these. We use them a lot here, and you'll also be using them a ton in Calc 2 when we're, you're working with sequences and series. And if you know these rules, it'll make that business that much easier in Calc 2. Okay, let's go ahead and look at our first rule. Our first rule was the first problem we looked at when the degree in the numerator and the degree in the denominator were the same. So let's go ahead and scroll up to that one. Here we are. The degree in the numerator and the degree in the denominator were the same. The highest power. Look for the highest one. They're both x squareds. So what I do then to find the limit in this case is I just take the coefficient that's in front of each one of those highest powers, and that's my solution. So let's go ahead and write that down in shortcut form. So if the degree in the numerator or the degree in the denominator are the same, the limit is the ratio of the leading coefficients. Okay, second. What if the degree in the numerator is less than the degree in the denominator? Well, the limit is zero. So let's go ahead and have a look there. If the degree in the numerator is less than the degree in the denominator. So the degree in the numerator here is x to the first. The degree in the denominator here is x squared, so the degree up here is less. And what's going to happen is this denominator is going toward infinity faster than the numerator is going. So it overtakes the numerator increase, and the overall fraction goes to zero. So our third case was when the degree in the numerator is greater than the degree in the denominator. And the limit in this particular case, depending on whether we're going toward positive or negative infinity, is positive or negative infinity. So in other words, the limit does not exist. Now in terms of horizontal asymptotes, for this case, there's no horizontal asymptotes. For this case, I have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. 
and for the first case I have a horizontal asymptote at whatever the ratio is of the leading coefficients. So those are our shortcut rules. If you memorize those, it's a lot easier than going through and dividing through by the highest power of the exponent and simplifying that. So shortcut rules are going to be good to know. So let's go ahead and look at a few quick problems now that we know these shortcut rules. Let's look at the limit as x approaches infinity of 5x cubed plus 2x minus 1 all over 6x cubed minus 5. Okay. Well, right away I note that the degree in the numerator and the degree in the denominator, the highest powers are the same, so my limit is just the ratio of these leading coefficients. Now I can't just write this down without justifying it somehow, so this is how I'll look for justification. You noted this because the degree in the numerator and the degree in the denominator are the same. So there's your justification. Now this also implies that I have a horizontal asymptote at y equal 5 sixths. Okay, let's look at the limit as x approaches infinity of 2x cubed minus 7 all over x squared plus 1. Okay, well let's look at highest powers. x cubed over x squared, that bit, that's basically saying the degree in the numerator is greater than the degree in the denominator, so I know that this is trucking off toward infinity because the numerator is increasing faster than the denominator. How do I justify the degree in the numerator is greater than the degree in the denominator? So that means the limit does not exist, no horizontal asymptote. Okay, third case. Let's look at the limit as x approaches infinity of 7x plus 1 all over x cubed plus 2x uh, minus 4. Okay, let's compare highest powers. I have x and an x cubed. The numerator is going toward infinity, the denominator is going toward infinity, but the denominator is going a lot faster, so this is going toward zero because the degree in the numerator is less than the degree in the denominator. So this implies a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. So you can see how much faster these shortcut rules make these problems. So again, it's very, very beneficial for you to look through at these shortcut rules. Now, everything that we've looked at so far has been a rational expression. I had a numerator and a denominator, but what about other types of problems that involve limits at infinity? So what do we do with something like this? I have the limit as x approaches infinity of x minus the square root of x squared plus 16. Well, if we plug infinity directly in, which of course we can't, we have to think approaching, this would give me infinity minus infinity. But the problem is this, you know, anything minus itself is zero, but we don't know if these infinities are the same. So I can't really say that this is zero, I have to check it. This is actually another indeterminate form. And this indeterminate form means to do more work again. Well, the more work that we can do here is to work at this algebraically by multiplying by the conjugate of the numerator. So I'm going to multiply by the conjugate. Now the conjugate of a minus b is a plus b, so what ends up happening here is the signs change in the binomial. Okay, so when we FOIL this out, the whole reason when we multiply by a conjugate, the whole reason we do that is so the outside and the inside terms disappear. So x squared, outsides and insides will go away, minus the last term squared. So I need a minus sign, x squared plus 16. So I'm subtracting this entire binomial. If you don't have parentheses here, you'll get the wrong solution. And I dropped my limit sign and I shouldn't have done that. So let's go ahead and squeeze that in. Because I'm still trying to take the limit of this expression. So it's not a good idea to drop my notation. Okay, so simplifying, we have the limit as x approaches infinity. The x squareds minus x squareds will cancel. I distribute the negative through and I'm left with a negative 16 all over x plus square root of x squared plus 16. And I can see the same thing here. I have a fixed numerator. The denominator is increasing without bound, so this is going towards zero. And there's my solution. Now if we look at this graph, it doesn't seem like 
well, first of all, infinity minus infinity was the general form for my limit before I got started, and I got zero in the end, but that doesn't prove that every form of infinity minus infinity is zero. Just this one turned out that way. So let's go ahead and look at a quick graph of this as well. So let's look at x minus square root of x squared minus, actually x squared plus 16. Let's have a look at it and let's look at a plot. Hmm, that's interesting, isn't it? It does have a horizontal asymptote. So this graph looks, you know, depending on the scale, will look a little bit different. But this gives us a pretty clear shot exactly what's happening here. I can see that as x goes toward infinity, this is getting closer and closer to the x-axis, but it will never cross the x-axis. So it's getting closer and closer to y equals zero. And I have a horizontal asymptote there, so let's include that graph because I think that provides some really good information that allows us to kind of re relay or tie in that idea of a horizontal asymptote with limits toward infinity. So again, up here, horizontal asymptote at y equals zero, and then we can see up here, this is verifying y equals zero is a horizontal asymptote. So again, Maple is really nice for looking at these types of things and allowing you to kind of compare your output from what you expected you get that expected that you would get to what you actually calculated. Now those are horizontal asymptotes. There's other types of asymptotes as well. Vertical asymptotes we'll talk about toward the end, but I, because I think most people have quite a bit of experience with those. The ones that we want to look at next are called oblique, or I'm more familiar with them called slant asymptotes. So oblique or slant asymptotes. Now these will occur when the degree in the numerator is greater than the degree in the denominator. Okay, well, if we think about the problems we just did, when the degree in the numerator is greater than the degree in the denominator, what happens is I get an, a limit of infinity. So this is implying that that is where I will come up with oblique or slant asymptotes, not horizontal asymptotes. So let's go ahead and write down the rules for oblique asymptotes. Okay, so this is how we work with finding oblique or slant asymptotes. You can find an equation for oblique or slant asymptotes by dividing the numerator by the denominator. And what this is actually doing is actually called long polynomial division, or you might have actually used synthetic, di synthetic division a little bit more in your other classes. I love long polynomial division. And what this does is it breaks it down into, from our original function, it breaks it down into a linear function plus some sort of a remainder that goes to zero as x goes to plus or minus infinity. So the remainder goes away. And then what happens is this linear function piece will be the equation that describes the slant asymptote. Now that's maybe a little bit difficult to understand when we write it out, but when we actually work a problem, it becomes quite clear. So let's go ahead and look at a problem where we're determining a slant or an oblique asymptote. So let's look at y equal x squared minus 4 all over x minus 1. I would like to determine all types of asymptotes. So to get started here, first of all, there's three types. There's a horizontal asymptote, there's a vertical asymptote, and then there's a slant or an oblique asymptote. So the first thing I want to do is check for a horizontal asymptote. To check for a horizontal asymptote, I can take the limit as x approaches infinity of the expression. I could check negative infinity as well. And what I get here then is infinity. Why? Because the degree in the numerator is greater than the degree in the denominator. So I t know right now that there's no horizontal asymptote. Let's go ahead and look at vertical asymptotes. Vertical asymptotes occur where the denominator is equal to zero. So vertical asymptote will be at x equal positive one, because if I plug a positive one in here, one minus one is zero, and my function is undefined. So I have a vertical asymptote at positive one. Let's go ahead and look at my slant asymptote. Well, first of all, all I need to do is check to see if the degree in the numerator is greater than the degree in the denominator. So let's look at our expression. 
the degree in the numerator is greater than the degree in the denominator. So this implies there will be a slant asymptote. Now, this is an improper fraction. You know, you think of improper fractions as something like, you know, six, uh, six fifths would be improper because the numerator is greater than or equal to the denominator. But now we're comparing these for the degrees. So in order to figure out what my slant asymptote is, I'm going to have to go ahead and divide through. Now if you like to use synthetic division, that's great. Uh, you go ahead and do that. Make sure you show your work. I like to use long polynomial division. With long polynomial division, make sure you always put a placeholder in for any missing values of our descending powers of x, x squared plus 0x minus 4. And what I do is I just start by estimation. So x times what is x squared? x. And then we multiply down. And I'm sure you guys have worked a lot of these problems back in the high school algebra um, classes. If you took college algebra, I'm sure you saw it there as well. So remember, we subtract down. And this is just following the standard long division algorithm. So what I end up with here is x minus 4 then. And then I estimate again x times what is x, and it's plus 1. So I multiply x minus 1, and then I end up subtracting down, and I end up with minus 3 as my remainder. Okay, now what do I do with that remainder? Well, first of all, what I want to do is I want to rewrite this entire expression as x squared minus 4 over x minus 1 as x plus 1 minus 3 over your divisor. So this is my linear portion, and this is my remainder. So if I took this remainder and took x approaches infinity, this entire piece would go to zero. So this piece that I'm look, looking at is my slant asymptote. And I have a slant asymptote at y equal x plus 1, which is a nice little line. It's a line that crosses the uh, y axis at 1 and it has a slope of 1. So you can get an idea of what we're going to go after here. We are going to grab maple and graph this and see what it looks like. So we have x squared minus 4 over x minus 1. And remember, you've got to have your parentheses to block off what the numerator and the denominator is. So that is what we're looking at. Let's get plots, and again, you can do a plot command too. Uh, plot command might have uh, avoided this problem. The scale is so bad we can't even really see what's happening here. So let's go ahead and look at the vertical scale. I don't think we need to have quite that much scale. Let's start at 50 to positive 50. And just let's see what's going on. We might have to update that as well, but it gives us an idea. Holy cow, there it is. Uh, let's zoom in a little bit more. See that slant asymptote? Well, that might be a little too much. And again, it's trial and error to look at these. Here, it's right there, that nice little slant asymptote. That's perfect. Now, another thing I did here is I changed on the vertical axis um, the number of tick marks that we're going to see. Because we used to just see like 5, 10, 15, 20. But because my y-intercept is at 1, I kind of wanted to zoom in on that point. So let's go ahead and copy and paste this into our notes so we can get a good idea of what's going on here. Now I don't want to shrink this up too much because we want to be able to see where I'm crossing these axes. Now it says I have a slant asymptote at y equal x plus 1. Well y equal x plus 1 means I have y-intercept at 1, and then I have a slope of a positive 1. So I'd rise 1, and then run 1 would be right about here. So it looks like to me my slant asymptote comes right through here. So this is y equal x plus 1 is my slant asymptote. And we can see here that as my graph approaches this slant asymptote, it never hits it, but it skims along it. And we can see the same thing happening here as well. So slant asymptotes are pretty cool, and again, you might see these written as oblique asymptotes as well. So um, let's go ahead and look at some more problems just in general and talk about asymptotes and limits at infinity. For this next one, let's look at the limit as x approaches 2 of x plus 2 over x squared minus 1. Now I don't want you to look at this problem and say, oh, the degree in the numerator is less than the degree in the denominator, which it is, but the first thing I want you to note, this is not a limit as x approaches infinity. 
So I cannot go through and talk about those shortcut rules. What I should do is plug directly in. I have 2 plus 2 over 2 quantity squared minus 1. 2 squared is 4 minus 1 is 3. So my solution here is 4 thirds. But what does this mean? We cannot use the shortcut rules, first of all. And why can't we use the shortcut rules? Because my limit is not approaching infinity. My limiting value is not approaching infinity. So that's the first thing. The second thing is it does not say anything about horizontal asymptotes. Because remember, if I want to talk about horizontal asymptotes, I want to take the limit as x approaches infinity. However, we can say something about a vertical asymptote. So vertical asymptotes occur where the denominator is undefined. So I'd have a vertical asymptote at x equal positive 1 or negative 1. And again, I get that from right here because when I set this equal to 0, I can see if I plug in a 1 or a negative 1 that my denominator would be undefined. Now let's also talk about the idea of a slant asymptote. When we talk about a slant asymptote, right away I can see that there'll be none because I need the degree in the numerator to be greater than the degree in the denominator. In my case, it's less than the degree in the denominator. Now as a quick note about horizontal asymptotes, this does have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0, but I can't find it using this limit. I need to take the limit as x approaches infinity to determine that. So if I think about this graph, I think right away I have two vertical asymptotes, plus or minus 1, and I should have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0 to get me started. So let's pop into Maple and see what we can get back out of this. Uh, first of all, plug into your function. You know, plug it in and make sure it's what you think it should be. Right click Plot, and then I did some scaling on this to get this to accentuate, but basically what I see here is this vertical line should actually be a dotted line. It's a vertical asymptote. And then I can also see I have this horizontal asymptote here as well. No slant asymptotes, it looks like. So let's paste this into our lecture and see if we can, first of all, size it to something reasonable and then talk about what those different asymptotic lines mean for this graph. So first of all, these should actually be dotted lines, as we talked about with Maple. If we wanted to use the plot command and do discount equals true, it would get rid of these lines. But I can also see here that I have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. So this is the line x equal 1, this is x equal negative 1, and here's y equals 0 as my asymptotic lines. Now knowing these asymptotes is going to be a huge benefit later on when we get into curve sketching because they'll really kind of give us an, an overview as to what a graph looks like before we even get started. Let's go ahead and look at the limit as x approaches 2 of x minus 2 over x squared minus 4. Okay, as a quick look at this, we'd plug directly in and I'd get 0 over 0. 0 over 0 is indeterminate. Indeterminate means to do more work. Okay, well what more work could we do? Well, we could look at this algebraically. So we can see that the denominator factors into x plus 2, x minus 2. And we can also see that the x minus 2's cancel. And I'm just left with the limit as x approaches 2 of 1 over x plus 2. Okay? So if I plug directly in now, I get 1 fourth as my limit. So does this mean that I have a horizontal asymptote at 1 fourth? No. Same thing here. I can't use my shortcut rules. The reason I cannot use my shortcut rules is this is a limit as x approaches 2. I cannot use my shortcut rules unless I'm approaching positive or negative infinity. Um, horizontal asymptote here is at y equals 0. And again, if you look at this real quick, the degree in the numerator is less than the degree in the denominator. So this limit goes towards 0 as x goes toward infinity. It doesn't go toward 1 fourth and I have vertical asymptotes at x equal plus or minus 2 and slow, uh, slant asymptotes I'll have none because the degree in the numerator is less than the degree in the denominator. So that's the information that this particular graph applies. So let's go ahead and jump into Maple and plot it as well. So again I have x minus 2 divided through by x squared minus 4 semicolon right-click plots, and hopefully 
Um, it's not going to give us some outlandish scale. It does. And let's change that vertically. Let's just do, let's say, negative 50 to positive 50. Might be a good start, might not be. That's not bad. Okay, and let's see, trying to figure out what this is saying to us. Okay, let's pop this into our original graph here, our original document, and let's have a look. It's kind of something strange to me. We're going to have to analyze this pretty close. Something's going on. Now, when I first look at this problem, I can see here that I have x equal negative 2 is my vertical asymptote, and it does appear that I do have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. But this is the question, what happened here? I thought I'd have a vertical asymptote at plus and minus 2. Well, we're kind of right and kind of wrong. If we look at this original graph, you notice that we got rid of one of the problem areas at 2 here. So at 2, I was kind of expecting to see a vertical asymptote, but we got rid of it. It was a removable discontinuity. So I really only have a vertical asymptote at negative 2. So let's look at this and rewrite it. Negative 2, but the positive 2 really isn't wrong either. It's a hollow point instead of an asymptote. So I have a hollow point at x equal positive 2. There should be a hollow point in this graph. And again, at x equal 2, and Maple doesn't catch that because it's just playing connect the dots. So we had to talk about this vertical asymptote a little bit. And we do have problems at positive and negative 2, but I had to kind of redo what I said they were. Vertical asymptote at negative 2, hollow point at 2, after I realized that the problem at 2 is a removable discontinuity when I could use this algebraically and factor and cancel. So that had some really interesting characteristics as well. Okay, let's go ahead and look at one last example. For this one, let's go ahead and look at the limit as x approaches 2 from the left. So we're back to a one-sided limit here of x minus 5 all over x squared minus 4. Okay, now we can't necessarily plug 2 directly in to see what's happening here because I'm not um, plugging in at one particular value. I'm approaching from a particular direction. So the first thing we might want to think about here is getting an idea of what this graph looks like first and then talking about what's happening. I know I'm going to have a little bit of a problem here because if I plug 2 directly in, I know that this function is going to be undefined at both positive 2 and negative 2 but I'm only worried about positive 2 from the left here. So that's some other information. So let's go ahead and look at uh, Maple to see what Maple shows us graphically to help us decide what's going on here. Okay, so to get started in Maple, we input our function, right click plot, or you can type in a plot command as well. And you might need to do some changes with your horizontal and vertical axes using this little button right here that allows us to change those axis properties. But basically you get a graph like this. And I see that I have this vertical asymptote at negative 2, another vertical asymptote at positive 2, and I also have this horizontal asymptote. It looks like at 1, okay, or 0. It's kind of hard to tell here. Probably 0 because I don't see that it's crossing. But it's hard to determine from here, so the math will help us do that. So let's go ahead and paste this into our document to kind of give us um, an idea of what's going on here. I don't know why they always come in so big. Okay, with our limits from the left and limits from the right, etc. Now if we look at this as x approaches 2 from the left, well here's 2, and as I approach from the left I can see this is shooting off toward positive infinity. So graphically, instantly, I can say, oh, this is equal to infinity, therefore the limit does not exist. So graphically, that tells me right away. Also, I'd like to see what Maple says about this limit when I actually actually ask them to calculate it. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use my limit notation, but we're going to add something a little different to it. I could copy and paste this, but just as a quick note, you can highlight your output as well and copy that value. Paste it into your function. Now I'm approaching 2, but I'm only approaching it from the right or sorry, from the left for this example. So after the 2, you can put a comma, and then you can either put in left or right to tell that it's a one-sided limit. And we can see here right away that 
it tells me that my solution is infinity as well. So Maple verifies that too. So we're seeing graphically and with Maple using their CAS system that this limit is infinity. But the question is, is how could we have figured that out? Well, one thing that we could have done is we could have noted that this does not factor and cancel. So it's kind of hard to do anything here in terms of looking at this algebraically. The only thing I could have done with the exception to this is to table values or I could have also kind of plugged in some values as two approaches from the left to get an idea of what's going on. So let's go ahead and look at the limit as x approaches 2 from the left. And we're not really looking at this algebraically or graphically. We're kind of just trying to analyze this to see what's happening. Well, if we plug in values from the left of 2, we're plugging in things like uh, 0, 0.5, 1, 1 1.5. If I take any of those values minus 5, I get a negative number. So this is not a dash, this means a negative number. I should put a number sign there to clarify. Now over here as I approach from the left as well, I can see I have a problem. As I approach from the left and I square those values, so like uh, negative, or sorry, 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, etc., and square and subtract, I also get a negative number. So I have a negative divided by a negative as a positive, so that's something. But I also see at 2, if I plug directly in, I have a vertical asymptote. Well, what happens at an asymptote, as this graph is showing right up here, is that an asymptotic line, I'm either going toward negative infinity or positive infinity on either side. So I know that this is going toward one of the infinities because it's right next to a vertical asymptote. And then this analysis right here gives me the idea that it's positive infinity. Therefore, the limit does not exist. Okay, a lot of information in this lecture, all important, all very helpful when we move on into some other sections on using derivatives and applying derivatives in terms of graphing techniques.